let's move in our notes to where we were, which was his humanity. And I was summarizing for you the testimony of genuine human characteristics as recorded by Ivan French in his article, The Man, Christ Jesus. A wonderfully concise, well-articulated explanation and description of Christ in his humanity. I refer you to what is in our library, the THM thesis of Ivan French, the limitations of the of God incarnate. If you want to do some extra reading in that realm, that would be the good thing to deal with. He talks about Christ's om omnipresence and the fact that he isn't everywhere when he was on earth. He's omniscience, but things he didn't know. He's omnipotence and things that he didn't do. But the testimony of the New Testament in its narrative and in its facts is a man. It's the man, Christ Jesus. I think we whipped through these paragraphs rather quickly. Conception was clearly miraculous, normal. Normal in terms of gestation and delivery. <coughs> Human growth and development. He grew and went through the same stages of growth mentally, emotionally, physically, as a human would do, with one marked difference. There was no sin to impair or hinder that growth or development. Mental development as well, unhindered by sin. You have the classic example, come to you, classic example of being 12 years of age and being able to floor the scholars of the Old Testament by a, an understanding that was apparently quite profound at 12. It's mark of mental development, a growth in understanding and apparently already beginning to understand something of his purpose. Ben? Speaking of his mental capacity, when do you believe or do you have a concept of when he understood that he was God? And how did he come to the understanding that he was God? Apparently by the age of 12 he understood he was to be about his father's business. But that's an interesting question. Because I'm not sure that there's a satisfying answer. I, 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 nothing comes to mind right now. I don't deal with this in my notes. Where you can say, that verse says, I have suddenly realized who I am. There's, there was a, there was a self-awareness of who he was. And you do know that exactly when it entered his consciousness is, is probably a moot point. What you do know is that he is fully aware when he began his ministry and preaching, so that's the record we have, fully aware that he was with the Father, that he'd come down from heaven, that he'd come for a particular purpose, he'd come to do the Father's will, he was going back to the Father. So that was a clear understanding. He knew that he was different from men, from, from, different from men in, in the sense of his origin. Yes, Nathan. Based on statements such as um, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before right. and so forth, um, could that imply that, that he had a memory of his prior existence? Or yeah. did his memory only extend back into childhood like ours? You know, you have that interplay in his life between supernatural knowledge, knowing what men were thinking, seeing their hearts, knowing their thoughts, and not knowing certain things, asking questions to find out information. 
you're telling the disciples you can go and catch a fish and pay the tax. Some supernatural, you know, cost on the other side of the boat. So you have this flash of supernatural power and knowledge and you have man normally with normal limitation. I would say that he, he did know. Glorify me with the glory I had with you. But he didn't know. You have that contrast. And I, I would just leave it at that. You have the contrast. You're talking about something so incredibly unique. But how do you define and describe in all detail what the inquisitiveness of our own minds wants to know? Which is a reflection of the intricate creativity of God anyway, giving, giving us our rational processes. There are things we want to know. And we, we don't like to be, to have that stifled, you know. There, but there is no information. So do, should we just go on speculating and speculating? And I think we have to come to a point of saying, he spoke as though it was something he clearly understood as having been. Knew who he was. Knew the purpose for which he had come. Stayed with it. Set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. Knowing exactly what he was going there for. So he has a will. He has emotion. There's a body. And a soul. Material, immaterial, emotion, intellect, will, person. So you read of him hungry and thirsty, tired and sleeping. You read of him rejoicing, sorrowing, weeping. You read of special love for special people. Perfectly normal human experience, isn't it? That extra special rapport with certain individuals an acquaintance only with other individuals. Special people, those in Bethany, for example, Lazarus, Mary and Martha. French puts it like this, down under the section on human experiences. When facing the struggles of Gethsemane, he craved human sympathy and support. And refers you to Matthew 36. And then I think, intriguingly, that Jesus recoiled as any human would at the thought of suffering to come. That's a good point. Nobody is... There, there may be a bravado about facing pain, but there's a reality of, you know what suffering is going to do. And certainly... Being crucified was not an unknown phenomenon of the day, known to be extremely painful. It recoiled at the suffering to come. That's genuine humanity. In fact, the cry, why have you forsaken me, at one level is an indication of a natural expression of a man in, a, in terrible suffering, caught in a very difficult situation obviously turning his attention to God above. So he deals with the human will. In the next paragraph, Christ had a will of his own. If it be possible, he prayed that, remember, Matthew 26, 39. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. Or you look at John 6 and verse 15. He knew that the crowd were coming to take him, and to make him king by force, so he withdrew. He understood, he made a decision, moved off. Went and prayed to the Father. This is a man. Independence upon God the Father.
One thing is very clear when you look at all the human characteristics, and it's this. The sinlessness and the holiness of Christ never detracted from the reality of his humanity. Okay. Sinless, holy, makes him distinct, but doesn't make him less human or more than human. Still a man. The human relationship with God, the Father, he said men ought always to pray and not faint. And what did he do? He demonstrated that very clearly and repeatedly in his own life. He prayed because he was man, fully and genuinely man. So French likes to draw this conclusion, and over the years I've understood what he meant. The portrait of Jesus of Nazareth is that of a solitary figure. You have to stop and say, just a minute, we're not talking about solitary in the sense of being a hermit, being a lone individual that moves off and prefers to have his own company, not the company of anybody else. Solitary because, not because of his real humanity, but because of his perfect humanity. In other words, he stands apart from the others by virtue of what he is and what he does and what he does not. Genuinely, perfectly human. Who can this be? What sort of man is this? Is an understandable exclamation on the lips of the disciples, isn't it? Macintosh, in his book, The Person of Jesus Christ, says, Jesus may be described as ideal or normal man, that these just epithets produce a totally wrong impression if we do not add immediately that manhood of this ideal type has existed but once in history. He is unique. The one quite unspotted life that has been lived within our sinful race. Never, ever, did anything wrong, not even in thought. Amazing. Standing in sharp contrast. Remember Matthew 13, I was thinking about this. Remember Matthew 3, verse 14? John the Baptist asked, Do you come to me? It should be the other way around. I think he understood that. And Peter's words in Luke 5 and verse 8. What did he say? Depart from me, O Lord. I left out a appositional phrase. Depart from me. What did he say about himself? Sinful man, O Lord. Big difference here. I'm in the presence of holiness. But never said you're not a man. You can also refer to John 3, 34, the fact that the Spirit was given to him without measure. Fulfilling a divine mission as a Messiah, but not in terms of contemporary Jewish messianic expectations. He came in fulfillment of God's design. He uses the title Son of Man, which can be used to speak of his true humanity. It's a favorite designation on his lips. In fact, if you read through the record, note, there are times when people refer to him as the Son of God and he responds by saying he's Son of Man. Not a correction of what they were saying. He just used the term Son of Man when they used the term Son of God. Only on several occasions did Son of God cross his lips. Either it was for I, or he would be referring to the Son of Man coming again, or the Son of Man in his sufferings. Those, that mixture is there in the context of the title Son of Man. Suffering, 
or the heavenly Son of Man coming in triumph and glory, in distress. I've given a number of references here for you. He never defined the title Son of Man specifically. There's no record that he did that. But the title apparently was accepted without too much surprise and was accepted as being linked to the Messiah. So you're reading John 1, 49 to 51. You'll notice references to the Son of God at the beginning there of these verses. Verse 49. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You, sh you shall see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see the heavens opened. There would be an immediate understanding that it's referring to end times. Coming. Coming at the end. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Although this is a reference, I believe, back to Genesis can be taken to think about the future to be indirect the angels of God descending upon the son of man you are the son of God identified himself as son of man John 6 27 I said referred that back to Genesis, the angels descending upon the ladder as a, a reference that can be tied in. Let's look into the future. John 6, verse 27. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. And notice, which the Son of Man shall give to you, for on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. Son of man, God the Father, say he's son of God. The context of everlasting life, of salvation. John 5, if you drop back to 25 through 27, notice the interplay again. The dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear shall live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Continue down in the passage and you'll come to the statement, verse 27, to execute judgment because he is Son of Man. Now notice that Son of God, Son of Man, or Son and Father, different contexts of judgment, of life, of coming again in triumph. Son of man glorified in John 12 and John 13. In John 12 verse 34. The question. We have heard out of the law, the crowd said, that the Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man. Now the point I want you to notice is that they said the Christ is to remain forever and then evidently without any objection linked Son of Man to the Christ. You say the Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is the Son of Man? Context of dealing with Messiah. Of course he answered them. And the answer, of course, is provided by his ministry as a whole. Matthew 16 talks about Son of Man, Christ the Son of the Living God, Christ then the Son of Man, coming in glory, judging, coming to his kingdom. So there's something of a backdrop that apparently those listening to these words should have been able to get. 
up to this point, they had been informed through what? Old Testament revelation had informed their understanding of things to be. Now here was a man preaching and teaching, showing a knowledge of the scriptures, providing evidence of his messianic identity, that information from the Old Testament should have been sufficient to alert them, to inform them of who he was. Mark 8 similarly speaks of Christ and then in the same context, Son of Man, which is identified as himself, speaking in the first person. Son of Man coming in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. An obvious reference to the end of the ages when everything is rolled up. Got one more reference to give you, and that's Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 63 through 65. Matthew 26, 63 through 65. Jesus before the high priest. Catch the significance of these words. Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Very significant statement. Identification of Son of God with Son of Man and Son of Man with coming triumphant Messiah at the end of the ages, coming in clouds of glory would be an obvious connection to that. But note the reaction of the high priest. Verse 65. Toys robes. He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. But he called himself Son of Man. Listen, if Son of Man was just a title of mere humanity and had no connotation beyond that of any kind, it would not have been blasphemy. But in saying, you will see the Son of Man, that's me, sitting at the right hand of power and coming in clouds of glory, that was blasphemy. Because that was too clear an identity of deity and of being the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. He's deserving of death. The others agreed. So he'll have dominion. He'll have glory. He'll have a kingdom. All nations, all peoples will serve him. They understood that from Daniel 7. So perhaps he used the title. On the next page, let me go there first. Or maybe on the same page for you. Perhaps he used this, didn't use the title Son of God as frequently as he did Son of Man. But, but maybe it's correct to say he did this to associate himself, to disassociate himself with a wrong, politicized, militarized, contemporary Jewish connotation of the Messiah. Now, listen, don't be surprised by this. Years have gone by. Revelation has been around several hundred years. People have had time to put information together, systematize what they had in the Old Testament. I know they didn't have computers. I know they didn't have concordances, but they had a remarkable ability to read and keep in mind and memorize and put together. And as the hundreds of years have gone by, you get what inevitably happens in any systematizing of a body of information, which is what? You get an encrustation of speculation that attaches itself to that body of information. It's inevitable. It happens with because of we are thinking, speculating individuals. There are always things we don't know, so we fill in the gaps and then fill in more gaps 
until we have a conglomeration of truth and fact with human speculation. And so they'd got to the point where they had reshaped the coming of the Messiah to fulfill some of their own aspirations. Got to overthrow the Roman Empire. Got to get back to being the nation in the land. Must have our own identity. Tired of being in captivity under the <coughs> subjugating heel of the Roman Empire that was not always kind in its treatment. And so they had militarized the Messiah. Politicized the Messiah. He'll come and <coughs> destroy these Romans. That was the contemporary connotation. They had not really understood humility first, <coughs> triumph second. But H.T. MacDonald points out that the, you, you can see the disassociation with that because he wouldn't let them make him king. <coughs> Maybe this was a way of him being able to state his oneness with humankind, that statement son of man makes him really representatively, typically, man. And even more so, to present himself against the prophetic backdrop, which is Daniel 7.13. So they would remember, you know, the repeated use of Son of Man, I think would cause those who knew the Scriptures, and they would pass it on to the others that were somewhat faulty in their knowledge, sort of thing we do. Those that know more inform others. Have you ever thought about this? Yeah, he's calling himself Son of Man. And he just spoke about the heavens opening and coming in clouds of glory. Maybe he's referring back to what the prophet Daniel said. What was that again about the prophet Daniel? Don't you remember? Let me show you in the scroll, that type of thing. I kept looking in the night visions, dear. Daniel records, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. He came up to the ancient of days, was presented before him. To him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. But notice what follows. So that, or maybe telic, in order that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. And then listen to these words, and they apply to the Son of Man. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Which kingdom? Spiritual one? Or a factual one? Physical, historical one? neither the spiritual or the millennial or the <coughs> eternal elements of the kingdom can be broken by any force. It's the ancient of days set it up in relation to the Son of Man. So the title speaks of his humanity and points to his deity and very specifically indicates messianic identity. They would, those who understood and who believed would apply Psalm 110, verse 1, obviously. This is the one the Lord said to my Lord. Outside the Gospels, yeah, I made the note for you on the page, it's mentioned, the title is mentioned by Stephen at his martyrdom, in obvious identification with the Christ, it, I think it will re rekindle memory of the identifying words of Jesus himself. He said, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Yeah, that's what Jesus said to the high priest. They got a reaction. I want you to think about the contrast with Jeremiah 17 and Psalm 146. I'll read Jeremiah 17. Think now what I'm saying. Thus says the Lord God, Jeremiah, speaking, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. 
for here, okay, if you leave that. Uh, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord, said <coughs> Jeremiah. Now Psalm 146. Do not trust in princes, in mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. You catch the significance of those words? Here's a stress on humanity. Son of man. This is one just like his brethren in every respect. Yet he said, believe in me just as you believe in God. He accepted worship from them. But men are told specifically by the prophet and by the psalmist in authoritative revelation, don't trust in man. Don't depend upon mankind, mortal man. Yet they did depend on the Christ. They did trust in the Christ. They did recognize him as Lord. They did recognize him as man. They were not violating this at all because he wasn't mere man. He was the son of the living God, the son of man coming in glory and in humility. Okay, you still with me on a balmy after pizza, post pizza afternoon? We, had a, we used to have a class, about a hundred guys, at one o'clock on a Friday, theology. Worst time slot of the week. And everybody was drowsy, and Ivan French was the professor. And one of the guys sitting near me had t totally gone off. He was gone. No noise. He was just gone. And the his friend sitting by him tapped him, said, Pastor French says, open in prayer. <laughs> and he stood to his feet and prayed. <laughs> of course, that woke everybody up. <coughs> and when he was over, the Ivan French said, now that you, our dear brother, have had your devotions for the day, can we continue? <laughs> you back with me. Yeah, Chris. So you're saying in here you know, that, uh, that the title Son of Man speaks of his uh, humanity, but yet in the day he says, believe in me as being the Son of Man also speaks of his deity as well. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the identification of Son of Man with the Christ, the Messiah, the coming Son of God. An understanding of what Son of God means ends up with Son of Man obviously having deity connotation as well as humanity connotation. Probably Son of Man allowed him to have a little bit more flexibility in his title in claiming to be man and in pointing back to Daniel 7 and that special individual standing before the Ancient of Days. So yeah, I think it has a dual connotation and as a matter of fact, H.T. MacDonald makes that point in his little booklet on Jesus, human and divine. I thought it was a good point. He used Son of Man from the very beginning of his public ministry. He uses it in his final words when he's condemned to death. And coming back to Nathan's and, so, and Ben's questions, there was a self-awareness because I think he knew that he was speaking about himself when he said, in the future you'll see the Son of Man doing this and being there. He understood what he was saying and they understood as well. So he declared his deity in association with his humanity, showed who he was messianically and in terms of Daniel 7, that puts him in place as having a very specific, special identity. Yeah, Ashley. Is there any connection 
between this and Ezekiel being called the Son of Man? Ezekiel's reference though, repeatedly to Son of Man is not a reference to being identified as the Son of the Living God or in Messianic settings it points to him as being human representative, right? It's a different context. Yeah, you're right, that's a repeated emphasis in Ezekiel. But he's son of man speaking as God's prophetic spokesman. Here, the connotation, the, the contexts are such that when you look at what's going to happen in the future and where he'll be, it, it kind of moves Ezekiel off the stage there. If they had any concept of Ezekiel in the background as, as they thought about the Old Testament, it can't be this one. It must be a reference here to Daniel 7. But that means that all the peoples and nations and men of every language are going to serve this Christ. And, and this is the stunning thing. If they, if they quoted those verses, and it's no doubt that those who understood the scriptures would have been able to quote it because their memorization program abilities were prodigious. The stunning thing was that this one whom the nations would serve, to whom the everlasting dominion had been given, was going to be crucified by the hands of men. That's what that's always the sharp contrast. Yes, Nathan. Is there a gospel or gospels that, that use this title more than others? I think the synoptics. I don't know. I'd have to check the statistics. I, I did see statistics somewhere, sometime. I'll, I'll look for it. I've got them in my notes somewhere. Not in the syllabus. Yeah. Dr. Cragen, is there any connection with uh, I guess the use of the Son of Man and the conception in the Jewish mind at that time tied to any of the passages concerning his suffering? I mean, did they have any understanding? It seems like their conception excluded that, yeah. that aspect entirely. And I'm just curious if there was any understanding of that at all, or who were they associating passages, for example, Isaiah 53, with, if not the Messiah in that case? You know, I think the ones that, like Simeon, who was waiting for the consolation of Israel, those type of individuals may have had a better understanding of humility and triumph. The chronology may not have been exactly where it should be, perhaps necessarily, but they, they did understand that salvation came through this servant, suffering servant of the Lord. Couldn't read Isaiah 53 with a believing heart and not catch the significance of the suffering servant's death and atonement. No. But I can't take it any further than that. Fifty times, I do know this, Nathan, but fifty times plus in the Gospels, he did use that of himself. But they would put it in the context of the synoptics more than John's Gospel, I believe. So he knew of himself to be of heavenly origin, and possessor of heavenly glory and performer of the mission of God of being the Messiah of returning to the Father of returning in glory okay a quote from H.D. MacDonald Seen, therefore, according to the distributions of its use and the contexts which it occurs, and I've mentioned those, it becomes certain that Jesus took the title as stating his oneness with humankind as really man. But, but with this oneness with man, there goes into the term the thought of his uniqueness in humanity by appointment of future glory and transcendent sway. This primary significance was enriched, especially towards the closing days of Jesus' ministry with the added thought of suffering. He continues in that vain little, Son of Man must suffer when the Son of Man comes in glory. You have a contrast there between idea of suffering and idea of sovereignty, meeting together in the use of the title 
Son of Man. It's obvious that at some point wrong theories of humanity would be thrown out. Just as there were wrong theories of deity, so there'd be wrong theories of humanity. And let's just go through this quickly. There would be the statements, the accusations, the bold declarations, the convictions of men that his humanity was unreal. Couldn't be. It's, it's impossible. We can't figure out how this could be. God c cannot become God-man. That's out of the question. This is the existential thinking of the first century as well. Got to reject it. Deity cannot be contaminated with material substance or deity and material substance are just not going to come together. It is inconceivable. But the fact that it's inconceivable to your mind doesn't mean it's not a fact in terms of what God who can do the impossible can do. And so you have the ancient form of docetism, the modern form being Christian science. Docetism was a philosophy they wouldn't allow this. So docetism actually you may define as a prolonged theophany. Extreme. Prolonged theophany. The appearance of God in a non-material form extending for 33 years. Prolonged. Or, m more moderately, perhaps, adoptionism. Natural son of Joseph and Mary, Christ came upon him at his baptism. John attacks any ideas of these in his first epistle. In chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 5, that's very obvious. Or you could go to an incomplete humanity that we refer to as Apollinarianism. Replacing of the rational soul of a human being with the eternal spirit of the Logos. Sort of surgical operation taking place. Suck out this, replace that. I get visions in my mind of laser beams and big machine moving across a lab, focusing on the forehead. Take that out, put that in. That, that crosses my mind, modern age. It's a way to understand what Apollinarianism was teaching. Mixed up with irrational souls and rational souls or intellect. Gregory of Nazianzus expressed the problem this way. The unassumed is the unhealed. If the incarnate Christ did not have a human mind, then this aspect of our sinful nature would not have been redeemed or covered by the atonement of the cross. If he had no human mind, our mind cannot be redeemed. Modern form of Apollinarianism would be that teaching of Henry Ward Beecher in the 19th century and three different writers in Europe, Hoffman, Ebrard, and Guess, whom you probably have not heard of. Not a human soul or a human spirit, but the Christ assuming a human body. Cross-reference to A.H. Strong's Systematic Theology, page 686, if you want further definition. And with that, you can take a 10-minute break. I want to talk about the Incarnation and the Virgin Birth. But as I come to that, I just want to straighten out two things about the statistics I found in my notes what I was looking for. There are 83 occasions on which the title Son of Man is used. Association with suffering and death, with triumph and glory. But 50 times he uses that of himself. Okay. So of the 83 times, not all are from his own lips least 50 times. This one then is the incarnate Son of God born of the Virgin. I've divided the material like this. Becoming human, how it was expressed. Becoming human, how it was accomplished.
becoming human, what it accomplished. And that kicks us into significant debate concerning his nature. How it was expressed. Now listen, <coughs> when you're talking about somebody coming into the world of human life, especially one who is God and who has existed before, you obviously cannot use normal words to express that. Makes sense. How is the English language, the Greek language, the Latin language, how is it going to express this extraordinary event? They use born and conceive. The narrative accounts use those because they are correct but by themselves they give the impression of just ordinary humanity. He said to himself, to this end, I was born. Indicating, of course, his beginning at birth, that is, his God-man status. It's still true to observe that there is something very different about him. So I made a list of other expressions that are used referred to the coming of the Christ the first time. He was the word that was made flesh. Dax, that answers your question to break to you. Dax asked a question about how was this accomplished? I mean, did God take something from Mary in terms of material substance with its number of chromosomes and somehow make him from, from Mary, material substance. Well, the Word was made flesh. However you want to try and explain it now, you have to realize you're talking about real humanity, real substance. He had skin, he had hair, he had fingernails. <coughs> came down from heaven. Word was made flesh, this Word came down from heaven. This guy's different. Sent into the world, this is the living bread that came down from heaven. Romans 1, key phrase here, made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Romans 8, in the likeness of sinful flesh, so don't make him sinful flesh. Sent forth, made of a woman, would be an intriguing statement from Galatians 4 to think more about. So really, his humanity was gotten through Mary. He took part of flesh. Hebrews 2 speaks about making it very clear that he's like his brethren. Made lower than the angels. It was necessary for him to be made like his brethren that he might die for them. Eh? A body was prepared for him. He was manifested to take away sin. He's the, the second man. He's from heaven. It's him in the form of God, the form of a bond slave in appearance as a man. All of those expressions standing together give you no other conclusion and here was something unusual that was having to be expressed. Luke 1 says, Your wife shall bear you a son. Those are the words given to Zechariah. Remember? The words given, that, those are the words given to Zechariah. Did you catch it? Your wife will bear you a son. That was customary. But when you get down to Luke one thirty five, shall be born of you, addressing Mary. Luke one thirty five. <coughs> Speaking to Mary, not to Joseph. And the angel answered and said to her, The Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason, the Holy Spirit shall be called the Son of God. The Holy offspring, I mean, the Holy One that will be born of you is the Son of God. Words to Mary alone. Wise men saw the young child and his mother. Catch the significance of that. Saw the young child and his mother. Maybe Joseph wasn't there, but it would be customary to speak about parents, I'd think. Take the young child and his mother. Don't take your child, Joseph. 
that's maybe you're not to make too much of that. But take the young child and his mother and go to Egypt. He was evidently not of illegitimate birth either, for if that was so, he would not enter the assembly of the Lord for how many generations? How many generations from illegitimacy? Ten. But where did Simeon dedicate Christ? This one who was spoken to by the Spirit to go there and see the consolation of Israel in the temple. It makes certain for the reader that has any questions about the legitimacy of his birth was legitimate. Don't make any accusations suggesting otherwise. Otherwise the Spirit was mistaken in, in directing Simeon to go to Christ who was indeed of the seed of David according to the flesh coming as the special one. So how was it accomplished? By means of the virgin birth. Better virginal conception. But never said that way because the phrase is virginal birth. And I guess that's acceptable because the Hebrew indicates that she was still a virgin when she gave birth to her son. Clearly foretold in Isaiah 7.14, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call him, etc. Alma, or Alma, most appropriate word in the Hebrew language to designate Mary as the virgin. It would never be applied to a married woman who is now ready to remarry, but it would apply to an untouched virgin, which would be seen in the use of Parthenos anyway in Matthew's Gospel. So careful use of language to make sure that you understand this was a virgin who gave birth to a son. Startling. Indeed, something of cosmic significance given to the king by the prophet Isaiah. And the virgin birth and her virginity is recounted very carefully <coughs> in Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2. And there's one statement in particular that you can refer to in these chapters which shows you that there's a careful guarding of even anybody suggesting the possibility of a human father. And that would be Matthew 1.25. This is Joseph responding to the command of the angel to go and take her to be his wife. In other words, remove the betrothal. And kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his, and he called his name Jesus. Very significant terms. Kept her a virgin until she gave birth. Most unusual, almost unnatural. Wife and husband waiting for the birth. Before there would be consummation of the marriage union. This was of God. This was a good man. This was a good woman. Chosen of God for this purpose of being the adopt for this one to be the adopted father of his only begotten son. Definition for the virgin birth. Make a note. This is the definition I'd like to see. If you get asked to reproduce. It is that miraculous act whereby Jesus Christ was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And don't stop there. Continue so you show you've caught the significance of the virgin birth with the result that the second person of the triune God was joined eternally to a real human body and nature. If you stop short, you leave open the door to suggestions of adoptionism or at least 
his humanity withdrawing when he ascended into heaven. Let's think about the consequences of the virgin birth. He became the God-man forever. So include that in the definition. And don't confuse, surprisingly enough, it is quite amazing how many Protestants have confused the virgin birth with the Immaculate Conception. It indicates that they are thinking right in one way, that, that, that this is a virginal conception. But it indicates they really don't know what Catholicism teaches, which maybe a lot of us never did. Immaculate Conception being that Mary was born free of sin and holy. The real miracle was her birth, because she was born of a father and a mother and became completely holy so that she could give birth to a holy son. Could you repeat that definition again? Yeah, it's on page 19. should be there. It says definition. Under number one, number two. Okay. <coughs> Don't confuse the Immaculate Conception. Yes, Dennis? The Catholics also uh, believe that uh, Jesus, uh, Mary had no other children. The, the brothers referred to in the scripture are not Jesus. Right. Yeah, that she was perpetual virginity. Right. right which, as far as I remember, came later. In fact, the um, Immaculate Conception, I know for sure, was declared by Pope Pius in 1854, but I'm not sure about perpetual virginity, whether that was before or later. 1954. Was it 1954? From 1945 or 1954. Yeah, one was in the century, yeah. And also that she was assumed into heaven, she never died. Bodily assumption into heaven, yeah. I wish I had slides available to show you of the frescoes. No, sorry. Not frescoes. What do you call that thing when you... Mosaics. In the Catholic Church, Basilica, not cathedral, that stands on the top of the hill looking down over Lyon, France. <coughs> because you'll be surprised at the presentation of Mary in those mosaics. She is not only the Queen of France, the Queen of Heaven, but she's the sender of the Apostles, the giver of the Spirit, and a host of other activities. She is number one. The reason why they have that dedicated to her is because 100 years or more ago, a plague hit the city of Lyon, and the inhabitants and the city council prayed to the Virgin Mary for the plague to stop, and it stopped. And to this day, the city council brings a special offering to the basilica in, on the anniversary of that particular day. And they acknowledge Queen Mary. And there's a special statue there of Mary, the Black Mary, I think they call it. You've got all these candles burning. I used to have a terrible urge to blow the candles out. <laughs> But obviously, common sense prevails. Because we take visitors there, it would be, this is terrible. See the worship of the Virgin Mary. But it's very real. You see it in some churches, you don't see it in others. The elevation of Mary as the receiver of the prayers of the saints, as the one who influences God the Father to respond to your prayers. You know, she is the co-redemptrix as so far as French theology is concerned, she's the co-redeemer with Jesus Christ. No. Special woman? Yes. A virgin? When she gave birth to Christ? Yes. A godly woman? Yes. Seer Magnificat. A good father? Adopted father? Yes. For the purposes of God, that a special man might come. Yeah. Dr. Craven, is there any, um, ex well, maybe not explicit, but uh, some biblical texts that just point to the fact that she's not without sin, that, that would be useful in, in uh, bringing to the table, I guess, in refuting that type of doctrine? No. Except that she's born of the line of David. So she's a normal individual. So the description, explanation given of any normal person would be given of her. You have to 
posits something from outside with a different agenda to break into the record and says she can't be like ordinary people because she's the most favoured one. She was favoured. God did choose her for whatever reason to be the mother of Esau. I think, I think you can speculate to this extent. So far as God was concerned, this was the best woman that could be used to be the mother of his son, take care of him while he was growing up, and, and who would respond in a godly way as she did. But you have to come with another agenda and say, I've got to break into the record here and invest these words with most favoured one with some other concept of exaltation and sinlessness. And where there's the worship of the Virgin Mary, this is going to be done. I, but no, she's an ordinary person of the line of David. And if they acknowledge that, they, they, they have to acknowledge sinfulness. And that is acknowledged in the, frankly, indirectly, in the promulgation of a perpetual virginity or immaculate conception, particularly immaculate conception. Because something had to make her different from what she normally would have been. <clears throat> that is holy. Good question, but there is no. Yeah. What, what do you think about the uh, Magnificat when she calls God her Savior? Um, right, significant word. Yeah, I mean, as far as you know, Savior from what? If it wasn't a Savior from sin. There would be a deliverer from sin, it had to be. Good point. Nathan. I, the response to that would be that she was delivered, it's just that she was delivered before her birth. Grace was given to her at conception rather than after. So he is her savior, just at a different point in time. In right. Her life. Right. Then we'd have, we'd have to just look again at the record as a whole. Yeah. That's just what their response is. Mm. There's always a response to something. Okay, what was accomplished? That Christ, look at these main heavy headings here. That Christ, the Son of God, was now Son of David in the flesh. <coughs> okay. Then the astounding words of the angel to Mary. The penetrating question of Jesus and the provision of the two genealogies to back that up. At second point, that Christ, the Son of God, was now of humble state. We'll spend a bit of time on that next week. And then finally three, that Christ had now both fully human and divine natures. And we'll talk about what that means, hypostatic union. So what did it accomplish? Turn with me to Appendix A. Appendix A. Introduce you to the Writings of Alva McLean. I got permission to extract this from his unpublished Christian theology notes at Grace Seminary. Purposes of the incarnation of our Lord. Think about these. Now, I guarantee that the majority of you are going to react to one of them almost immediately in, in almost a <coughs> knee-jerk reaction. I counsel you to pause and think. There's no error here. But there's some profound thought. What was the purpose of the incarnation? Simply put, of course, we can say to send a saviour who would be the coming Messiah. For he's not a man as I am, quoting Job 9, that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there an umpire, a referee, a um, day's man, old English between us that might lay his hand upon us but that was the perennial complaint of Job or mankind how do we get together with God there's no one who seems to be able to stand in the gap between us John 1 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and then 1 John 4 hereby we know the spirit of God every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming the flesh is of God Etc. Now, on the basis of those three, he makes several points and then moves on to six purposes. 
is Job's complaint. Universal feeling of our sinful race in the presence of an infinite God. How do God and I talk? Vast difference between us. Who overcomes that difference? Unbridgeable chasm, it seems to be. Second passage reveals God's historic answer to man's ancient complaint. It is this watershed event, critical event, crucial event. The incarnation of God in Christ, the eternal Son made flesh, clothed in the likeness of men. In other words, McLean says, it is no longer valid for me to say to God, he is not a man. For the God who today sits upon the throne of the universe is also a man by the stupendous miracle of the virgin birth. Third passage, crucial importance of God's act at Bethlehem. It's no, nothing other than a direct statement of scripture. Here you have the facts of, the, of Christianity, the incarnation of God in Christ being clearly revealed in the New Testament. I'm trying to summarize that paragraph. Read it for yourself. <coughs> Augustine, I noted, said you'll never find in the classics the phrase, the word made flesh. It is unique to Christian writing. If we should inquire, point four, why it was that John and the other New Testament writers regard the incarnation as a fact of such high importance, the answer is found in the divine purpose. Why did the eternal Son empty himself as the, of his pre-existent glory, clothe himself in human flesh and sinful form, and come? Here's the fivefold answer, sorry, fivefold. One, think. God became incarnate in Christ in order that he might die for sinners and thus save them from their sins. Straightforward statement. We would have picked it up immediately. Probably for most of us that will be the first answer we'd give to the question, why did he come? But notice the three axiomatic propositions. First, the wages of sin is death. Second, Experience of death involves separation of body from spirit. Third, the eternal God cannot die. So in order that God might experience the reality of death in all its fullness, he must become incarnate, clothe himself in a body of flesh and blood. God cannot die, but God incarnate could die and did die. Only an incarnate God could be a sinless, unblemished saviour of sinners. You know, that stuff makes you think. Christ is God. This is God incarnate, the Son of the living God. But God cannot die. And if God did die, then ipso facto, Christ is not God. But how could he die for sinners if this was God becoming man? can't split it. Jesus is the one we're talking about. The God-man. He could die and he did die. Boggles the mind. Easy to say he came in order to die for sinners and save them from their sins. Not so easy when you take a step back and say, now let me just think about that a little bit. God can't die. Shall I rechange the statement I've just made? No, it's correct to say he became incarnate in Christ in order to save sinners from their sins by dying for them. So he says, look here, bear these facts in mind. The first chapter of the book of Hebrews describes the infinite glory of the second person of the triune God. Maker of the worlds, upholder and heir of all things. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Angels are to worship him. Then the amazing revelation, made a little lower than the angels. He, by the grace of God, might taste death for every man. Absolutely fascinating. Your throne, O God, is forever, but you will taste death for every man. Fascinating. 
the goal of Geth Bethim, he had a way of putting these phrases, you know, the sort of things you can use in the pulpit, you know, give him credit if you do. The goal of Bethlehem was the place of the skull. The mystery of the virgin birth to be read in the light, in the blazing light of Calvary. The incarnation of our blessed Lord was the first historic step of the eternal God on his solemn march to the judgment of the cross. And you could go on. And after the judgment of the cross, a return in triumphant glory to set up God's kingdom. So I think point 4C is a good one. Don't gather people into your churches just to talk about the birth of Jesus. It's not the preaching of the manger alone, huh? It's the preaching of the cross. That's the power of God unto salvation. Yeah, Tom. His, and one C, his uh, second proposition is the uh, experience of death involves the separation of the body from the spirit. Yeah. How, did, uh, how does he support that? I mean, he's kind of defining, is it uh, um, in your scripture? That yeah, it would be scriptures like the reference to Rachel when she died and the spirit departed before she died. Spirits of just men in after, after death, the evidence of the fact that men die and their body goes into the grave, but they go into Hades. Or the believers present with Christ. Remember the anthropology? So yeah, death, physical death is the, the separation of the immaterial from the material. Immaterial departing to another dimension of existence. The material now being here subject to decay. To be to to be dust returning to dust. Is there scripture also also talks about a second death? So is there is there a way that? Yes. I guess I'm, I'm well. I'm, you know, it's one of those things. If you accept the person's propositions, that, that the conclusions are, and I, and I, I guess I'm I see the first one very clear. The second one, is there any way we could talk about death in terms of a spirit, other than a step? I'm, What's the second death? I'm not, it is a reference to the second death. Second death would be the finality of existing as an unbeliever in a state of torment forever. Okay, that's it. That would be the second death, which has no power over the believer because we move on into eternal life, living in the presence of the, of the Son of God and of the Father forever and ever in the new heavens and a new earth. But there is death for the believer and death for the unbeliever as a normal part of human experience in, in history and time. But your immaterial lives on in another dimension, not subject to time. Remember that we, we are eternal in one respect. We have a birth in time physically. We die physically, but we continue to live or to exist. And remember, Christ himself yielded up his spirit. He's, Im he's immaterial. So he physically died. Okay. Come back to the point. Why did he come? Why the manger? Why the stable? It's a good warning, you know. You've been in churches, I'm sure, like I have been, where you hear a nice little story based upon the creation scene Shepherds came, wise men came, birth of Jesus, and hardly a mention of born to die, which, which is necessary, I think, in understanding why was he born? To live a sinless life and to die for you and I. But if he's a baby in a manger, and that's it. Well, safe. Don't have to be challenged to think about sin. Second purpose. God became incarnate in order that he might share with many his own eternal life. Perhaps we would have thought of that one very quickly too. Perhaps it's a simple thing, says McLean, that we can say God shares his life with men.
talks about modernistic thinkers. He's not God, a God of love. Is he not the great giver? Is he not sovereign in his ways? Why then must his bestowal of spiritual life wait for such a metaphysical mystery as an incarnation by virgin birth? If God's a God of love, he, he surely could have done everything that needs to be done to, for, for men to be delivered for eternity without gain by the virgin birth, the incarnation of the Son of God and the cross. It takes two verses. John 10.10, 10, please know these verses. I am going to ask you this for the exam. I'm going to let you know how many, but you will need to know some of the purposes with at least two references of Scripture for each. John 10.10, 10, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's how God shares his eternal life. First he gives his life for, in order that he might give life to. The way of life for us is the way of death for Christ. Second passage, listed here, John 6, 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Only the second person of the Godhead is specifically called the bread of life. And only after he enters the world by virgin birth. The bread that I will give, he says, is my flesh, which I'll give for the life of the world. Only an incarnate God could give his flesh in atoning death for the world. No incarnation, no death, no death, no atonement, no atonement, no bread of life dying for men. Without a God-made flesh, no eternal life sinners and then we'll close on this one I'd like to finish five minutes early oh, we've got four minutes yet I'm doing that for Dr. Pettigrew's sake so because the changeover is delaying him beginning this I've got to unpack stuff and he's got to connect stuff so, so I'm, I just told him we'd give him five minutes our Lord became incarnate in order that this is an interesting one that he as God might know human life from the inside by personal experience. Think. Fascinating one. First time you do it, you go, come again? That he as God might know human life. Should have a correction there. Not eternal life, but human life from the inside by personal experience. He, he makes this point. There's only one way to have experience. That's to have experience. You may read number of, many books on poverty, investigate the conditions of poverty. You may study thousands of case studies in the sociological departments and welfare departments of universities and governments. But you will never know poverty by experience until you have actually become poor and lived as such. So he says this. Notice he precedes it with the words reverently that even an almighty God with all his omniscience that not even can know human life by experience without being born into human life and living in human life. To this end, he that was rich became poor. He that was in the form of God took the form of a servant. Hold your reaction. Just let it sit there for a while. Read through the next few paragraphs. Think. Don't react right away. Because I know what your reaction is going to be. It was mine too. How can you say this? Read on. God needs nothing in himself. The need was ours. He didn't need that experience. In all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. He says, here we have the assertion of experience and its reality. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. He has suffered being tempted, he's able to succor them that are tempted. To this end he was made in all things like us 
sin apart. Very significant statements. Have we suffered? He suffered more. Have we been tempted? Tempted in all points like as we are. Have we tasted the bitterness of poverty? He had nowhere to lay his head. Do we know what it is to be slandered? He says, reproach has broken my heart. Have you known of the heartache of friends that have proved false? He was wounded in the house of his friends. Good points. Merciful and faithful high priest because he knows what it is to be tempted and to suffer. Look at paragraph 3C between now and Tuesday. Of the three eternal persons in the triune God, only the Son has passed through the experience of human life. And then you've got two more purposes to go. I'll say this. No one can look at Christ ever and say, you don't know what it's like to be human. I do. I was born. I lived. I died. I rose again. I am the God-man. I have been fully human. You have nothing in mitigation to offer. I know everything. In fact, he now has the first place in everything. Talk about that phrase on Tuesday. Okay.